Hello and welcome to Life Questions. I'm your host, Bill Harris. Our program is all about questions about life sent in by you, our viewers, and our guest ministers have consented to research your questions and come up with responses that are grounded in the Word of God. Our local ministers are here with us today to share their research, and I'd like you to meet them at this time. And they are, first of all, Pastor Randy Davis of the Bridge Church here in Lima, followed by Pastor John Berger of Transform Church, also here in Lima, Ohio. And then there's Pastor Jason Goss of Wapak Church of Wapakoneta, Ohio. And finally, rounding up our panel is Pastor Darwin Hartman, who is another local minister, a local pastor in our church here in Lima. Gentlemen, we're happy to have you all today. And uh, listen, I'm, I'm going to take a couple of these questions that we got from viewers and, and try to put them into one. Uh, one part of the question says that in society today, holy living seems to be portrayed in a, in a gray area uh, rather than black and white, which would be God's view it's one way or the other. And then uh, another question along this same line says, well, foul language bothers this person. It says, is this something that Christians should not do, you know, use foul language or am I being legalistic? And, and uh, rounding off uh, that, I'd like to ask the question, without being legalistic, uh, what scriptural references do you have to show uh, how to live holy and how to correctly define what is unholy versus what is holy? That's a mouthful, isn't it? Yes, it is. <laughs> it is I remember seeing a shirt a, a while back that said, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. And oh. I thought, what an, what an oxymoron that is. Yeah. Uh, either that person was purposefully ignorant, um, you know, the Spirit and the Word give, give witness to the fact that unwholesome speech is not becoming of a believer, or they're being willfully uh, rebellious towards the Word and the, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. Uh, scripture's quite clear. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but rather what is good and necessary for edification that it may impart grace to the hearer. Uh, I shared recently with somebody that kingdom people have kingdom speech. In other words, when we're born again into a new kingdom, the kingdom of light, our speech changes. Now that's mm -hmm. gradually for some people as, as we're working out the old and allowing the Lord to work in the new, but most definitely our speech should be changing and it should be representing the kingdom that we are a part of. Uh, James in James chapter three would say, uh, blessing and cursing ought not come out of the same mouth. Mm -hmm. Jesus would say in Luke six, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, but an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil, for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So uh, sometimes what we say can be indicative of what is in our heart, and sometimes it's indicative of the kingdom that we belong to. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I would I tell a story, and, and it kind of goes along with this, but uh, Craig Krenzel was a Ohio State Buckeye football player at one national championship, and we all love Craig. He's a great guy. And, and uh, Craig, while he was at Ohio State, had found faith in Jesus. And when he went to the NFL, he got to work alongside John Kitna, who is a very dis disciplined and discipled young man as a uh, NFL quarterback. And they were playing together. And one day as Craig was on the field, he said, you know, when you put your helmet on, you're an NFL football player. And he said, I got on the field and I'm doing what I do. And all of a sudden Kitna goes, hey, Craig, or he says, Krenz, when you get your mouth saved, Mm. And Craig, Craig said for the first time in his life, somebody challenged him on his talk. But he said, that's what NFL guys do. That's what, that's football. It's, it, and that's what a lot of people will tell you. What's well, just the way life is that everybody, and it's true. Everybody does, man, but it's everywhere. It's, it's, it's profanity and, and cursing, whatever you want to call it. But that's one of the things that, about Christians, we're supposed to be different. And, and God doesn't just save your heart. He wants to save all of you. He wants you to look closer to him and when you go to that holiness as obedient children do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance and he was in ignorance he didn't realize what he was doing he because he had always done it mm -hmm. okay but once you're called out you're no longer ignorant and that says but just as he who called you is holy so be holy in all you do that's not easy no it's not for it is written be holy because i am holy uh, Romans 12, 12, 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of the world. There's all kinds of scriptures that tell us, folks, we, we're not to look like the world. The challenge is, 
is when we go to our churches, if the church is doing its job, there are people there that are not yet professing faith. That's true. So you don't judge the church by everybody that attends it. It don't make you a Christian going to church any more than going to McDonald's makes you a Big Mac. Now, the more you go, the more you'll look like a Big Mac. But, you know, it's just, <laughs> I'm living proof of that. But, but the point is, we, we, we assume everybody that walks in out of a building has faith in Christ. They are conformed to holiness and trying to be right. It's not true. They're just church people. But it doesn't make them born again. But a born again Christian should show some holiness, some traits that look Christ-like, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what he said. Well, isn't the goal of being a Christian to look like Jesus? I mean, that, that's, that's like it. the end game. That's so then I, I need to change and I need to be holy. Um, I, I have a list of 18 questions. I'm not going to read them all because they're too long, but I did, uh, I did get them. So hopefully they'll have a link or something available. But just little questions like, um, is this decision being made in the attitude of Christ? Is this something that I'm, I'm trying to think like Jesus? Uh, could this decision addict or enslave? Will this decision offend someone? So those kind of questions, and there's scripture verses for each of those, it's much deeper than, than I'm just doing what I want to do or I'm doing it because everybody else does it or I'm doing it because that's what I've always done. There's a, there's a goal here to be holy. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, and I, we even talked about discipleship in our, the previous episode, that being a disciple is moving towards holiness. Moving that, that marker, I, I made a little bit more progress today. I made a little bit more progress right. the next day. Right. And so if I'm not doing that, then am I really being a disciple? And Jason, it, and it's where like legalism comes in is when it's people want to be the judge. They want to be our scoreboard. Yeah. Oh, you're you're not doing very good today. You know, and, and in my old church I grew up in, they used to have the clothes police. They'd stand at the door and they'd recognize any woman that didn't have a dress on and say, you need to go home and change. What? I look back yeah. and I go, man, what was wrong with us? You know, we're just happy to show up anymore. And, and, you know, I don't care if they're wearing a dress or pants suit or jeans and T-shirt. I don't care because I'm more concerned about their heart than their outward appearance. But there was a day, I think these people are afraid to portray holiness because they get into legalism and there is legalism. Sure. But yeah. remember, God is the one that's our judge. He's the one keeping the scorecard and he knows your heart. And when you say out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks, it's pretty easy to tell. If you squeeze somebody hard enough, what comes out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, when mm -hmm. you hit your thumb with a hammer, it's in there, so and, and it should I, be getting I better. Think that's exactly. You can't judge someone. Hey, I've I've walking in this journey of faith for two years. Right. Well, there's there might be a nominal change. There might be a drastic change. It's possible. But then you get somebody. Hey, I've been doing this for forty years, and you're the same as when you started. Okay, we need to have a conversation. There's yeah. something has not <laughs> yeah. been working yeah. as no far growth. as your transformation yeah. to becoming like Jesus. Yeah. And I think we are talking about legalism. There's a, another aspect of legalism and it, it is the self-imposed legalism. That's something that I've struggled with in my past. I'm doing this, so I'm this. I'm not doing that, so I'm that. That's still legalism. You're still operating by rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're talking about is the sanctification process, the process of being conformed to the image of Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. If rules and regulations could do it, then why would we need the Holy Spirit to make us holy. Right. And it's, so theologians use uh, two terms for sanctification. Um, one of them is progressive sanctification, and that is the daily walk whereby we surrender, Romans 6, ourselves to Jesus. And then there is the, the righteousness that we receive, uh, the declaration of righteousness, the, the moment we come to Christ. So Christ sees us as holy, but the natural outworking of that comes day by day as we surrender to Jesus and allow his spirit to live through us. Does everybody grow at the same rate? <laughs> I wish we did, and I wish we were all there. Yeah. Wouldn't yeah, it be not. wonderful? That's what we do right. sometimes, you know? What were you gonna say, Pastor? I forget. <laughs> but, but that would make as the church if everybody grew at the same rate it'd be easier to go okay you're at this stage and you're at this stage it's not everyone's a different yeah. I just remembered okay. I was thinking about 2 Corinthians 17 and following uh, or 517 and following it says everyone who's in Christ is a new creature mm -hmm. yeah. the, and so it seems like there should be an immediate change a new creature but it, it does take time. Sure. And, and when Lazarus was brought out, when, when Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead, mm -hmm. he brought life, but he told the people to take the clothes off, the, right. the, the, the grave clothes. So there's a process of unwrapping a new believer. And um, this process can take a long time. 
Uh, I think it's important, though, to realize that it is it, it is a track that's different. We're new creatures in Christ. Therefore, there should be a change. So, yeah, I think it's important. Jesus said that every we'll give an account for every useless or idle word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And now, so, let's face it. The enemy of our soul does not want us to progress in our faith. Sure. So you have to help people understand, even though you're not processing and progressing the way you think you should, don't let him beat you up to where you're get out of process. Mm -hmm. as, and I tell people, as long as, as long as you're in process, you're okay. Mm -hmm. But the day you quit the process, we got a problem. Yeah. And I think that's what the enemy does. He just tries to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants just to annihilate you mm -hmm. and get you to quit because you're an utter failure. And we all fail. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Some of us are better at hiding it than others. Mm -hmm. But we have to be honest with ourselves and to realize as long as you stay in process, you're okay. Mm -hmm. Just don't jump the process. Mm -hmm. All right, this is a good place to take a break. Why okay. don't we do that? And we'll come back and uh, field some more questions from you, our viewers. So um, stay tuned because you want to hear your questions answered, right? We'll look to see you in just a few seconds. Don't go away. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, thank you for staying with us. This next question reminds me of my uh, former days when I left television news and became a financial advisor. Estate planning was a part of my training. Three things that you learn about estate planning. One, um, you will die. Two, you have money. Three, when you die, someone will get your money. <laughs> so you gotta have a plan. And here, this lady says, I'm getting older and need to make a determination on what to do with my money before I die. I want to donate much of it to Christian organizations, but my children do not agree with this idea. What should I do? I was thinking of donating the money before they could get their hands on it, but I sense that my children are going to try to stop me. So. There's a lot going on there. There's a lot going on, yeah, yeah. A lot of dynamics. Any words of wisdom, gentlemen? Well, Proverbs 13 does say that good people leave an inheritance to their children. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with leaving inheritance to your children. But there's also nothing wrong with donating to an organization. It's your money. God gave it to you, so do what you feel like God wants you to do. The question kind of implies is, is there, are your kids ready for that kind of responsibility? Because if you do give your kids a, a large of amount money. of money, it can ruin them. It can. And that's part of the, the danger there. Yeah. Uh, I had a customer one time that she was explaining to me her wealth and she said, you know, my dad was very successful, but as a, a young person, young adult, I was horrible with money. And she said, so when my dad died, he had set it up. First of all, I had to take a money class, which I think she said Dave Ramsey. And she said, and he only gave me so much a month. And she said, I can't borrow against it. I can't get the money ahead. And she said, he set it to where I only get a stipend. And she goes, now I'm set for life because he was generous. But I thought, you know, that's bi that's biblical in sure, that not sure. only did he leave a good inheritance, but he did it in a good way. Yeah. And so I think, you know, if there's a way this lady can help, if she needs to give some to her kids, obviously that's not a bad idea. But you don't want it to be destructive for her right. kids either right. that they'll go out and squander it and waste it. Mm -hmm. So I get what she's asking. Uh, there are a lot of nuance, nuances to this question that I don't know. Uh, that we can answer it to your liking. Uh, I would say this, uh, continue to pray about it. Uh, talk with your pastor about it. Trusted Christian friends who are maybe older than you who have uh, gone through something similar in, in the past and go from there. Uh, but it's hard to answer it specifically, not knowing all the specifics. Yeah, I, I think I agree with, with all of that. Um, seems to me that uh, the, a principle of balance there would be something to pursue. Balance between giving, balance between passing on, uh, and then recognizing that in the passing on, maybe some restrictions there. If, if, if the idea is that it's going to be squandered or maybe it's a huge amount of cash and it looks like it's never going to come to an end, 
uh, and so then it can easily be squandered. But yeah, I think good godly counsel uh, would be helpful there. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say yeah, along that line, good godly counsel is to seek out a, a financial advisor that yeah. is Christian. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. is Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that he or she can help you to do that uh, along biblical lines. But right. it, it can be done. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to the next question here. Um, I am trying to help a friend through grief. And I have read that there are stages of grief. However, I, I am not sure I'm doing a good job of guiding her. She doesn't want to go to a counselor, and I don't want to leave her to go through this alone. So what do I do is what she asks. You've been, I'm sure you all have come across right. people who are in periods of grief. The, one of the best things you can do is, and, and all of us need to do a better job of understanding, if you've not really been through a, a grieving situation, be careful what you say. A lot of what we say is in ignorance. We oh mean well, goodness, yes. and and I, I warn every family at a funeral home. Somebody's going to come in tonight. They're going to say something, and you're going to want to smack them. Yeah. yeah, they mean well, but yeah. it's not right. <laughs> it, it's just there. It's you can't even yeah. be hurtful. Yeah, and I said so. Know ahead of time it's going to happen, and when it does, you'll be able to handle it. Because people just say things. It, it just they don't know. They're ignorant. Yeah, no. But the other thing is, there's a lot of groups available. And I just Googled this online the other day just to see. In our area, in the viewing area, there's at least four churches that have weekly grief share classes. And I would suggest to this lady, don't just, don't just tell her to go. Take her. Mm -hmm. Pick her up. That's a lot nice. of times they have dinner, and, and it's mm -hmm. fellowship. It's, mm -hmm. it's people there with the same, and they're at different stages. And I think the biggest thing we who are not grieving should help those who are is understand everybody grieves differently. And at different times and different well, levels. And we try to hurry them times. up. Oh, you should be further along than this yeah. is the craziest yes. thing you could say to it somebody is. going through it grief. Is. Yeah. yeah, and it's maybe important to think and understand that the, the stages that are referenced here are not set in concrete. Mm -hmm. uh, each person goes through them differently and maybe at a different pace, a different length of time for each one. I think from personal experience and, uh, and, and 28 years of 30 years of being pastor, um, sometimes saying nothing, just sitting with a person, yeah. Yeah. just That's being so present true. is yeah. the, so yeah. True. You know, you don't want to be one of Job's four friends. <laughs> uh, it's, it's better to be present and mm -hmm. silent mm -hmm. than to be present and, 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 and Speak out of ignorance. saying what right. yeah, had, doesn't need to be said. You, so. you may not have to guide her through the process. You just yeah. need to be with her through the process. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Job's friends had it right that first week or so. Sure. When they just sat with him mm -hmm. yeah. in sackcloth mm -hmm. and, and ashes. Mm -hmm. And then they opened their mouths. <laughs> and I know sometimes we're afraid to when it is time to speak. To speak, uh, I would encourage her, be a friend. Pray for her as I'm sure you are. Uh, listen to her. Uh, don't feel obligated to give too much advice. Yeah. Sometimes if you're not a professional, like Job's friends, you can say things that um, are inadvertently hurtful or counterproductive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and carefully encourage her, as you're led by the Spirit, to seek something like, like Randy had suggested, a group, and, and be her friend and go with her. Say, listen, I know you don't necessarily feel like this, but I believe it can be a benefit. Let's go try it out. I, I want to go with you as a friend. I'm, I'm going to lock arms with you, and we're going to do this together because I love you and I care for you. Yeah. And how many times have we been asked the question, how do you handle that, Pastor? How do, how do you walk a family through that tragic death? I show up, yeah. and they just look at you. Yeah. Well, what do you say? Most of the time, I don't say a word. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I've there. never been there. Yeah, yeah. just being and, there. And, you know, but they need your presence, and that's, that's huge. I, I think so. And, and beyond the presence, uh, five years ago, I had a daughter-in-law that was killed in an auto accident. And uh, it was more helpful than a thousand words for people just to come along and live life, mm -hmm. uh, do something. And it kind of, it kind of pulls you through the, the, the difficulties, all that, and get, lets you focus right. on other things. That life is still going on, yeah. and there's reasons to live, and there's reasons to be optimistic. So that's yeah. helpful, I, I think. Yeah, it, it, it's good to also, I think, make a list of things that you might want to say when you're ministering to grieving families at a funeral. Like, you know, I think one of the biggest ones that ought to be on that list, having lost two wives myself, and people coming up and they mean well, and they say, well, at least you know she's in heaven. You know she's in heaven. Well, yeah, I do know that, 
But right now, in my grieving yeah. period, I want her right here. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and that doesn't, it really doesn't get it. It doesn't help me to deal with the grief. It doesn't. Yeah. And, and you mean well. I understand you mean well. That's like I don't, I don't say anything about it. I know what they mean. And I do rejoice that, you know, they are in heaven. Uh. You know, and relative to that, um, 20 some years ago, a brother-in-law of mine was, um, his wife had cancer. And uh, the last three months that they, before her death, I asked him what, what the hardest thing is that you're dealing with. And he said the hardest thing isn't knowing what the future is for my wife. The hardest thing is the separation that's happening already and he's alone and he needed someone just to live life with him yeah. as it's coming at him. So, yeah. yeah. A couple yeah. of things I always try to share with people at funerals is number one, those who love deeply, grieve deeply. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And secondly, there's there tends to be a, a great outpouring of love and affection and support in the first couple of weeks. But four, six, 12, 18, 24 months down the road, we tend to forget about those people who are still grieving. Right. And I, said, mm -hmm. I said, be an encouragement long term, not just in the short term. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay, um, another question here that I wanted to try to go into here. I saw a Facebook post from uh, um, a pastor, not a local pastor, but the pastor was criticizing another denomination. This doesn't seem very Christ-like to me. I understand there are differences, but is it really okay for a Christian to speak so negatively about another church? How do you... Short answer, no. Yeah. But at the same time, I didn't see the post, so I couldn't tell you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if the church was doing something that was against the Bible, then there, there should be a crow. Then I wouldn't do it in per oh, public. I would do it in person. Mm -hmm. But we now Facebook has allowed us to do a lot of things and say things we wouldn't say. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I think sometimes, uh, you know, we live in this tension on social media as believers between wanting to share truth with other believers mm -hmm. and also understanding that our life is an open book to non-believers who are on social media. So there's this constant tension and, and sometimes we err more on one side than the other. Mm -hmm. um, Paul was an apostolic leader because I hear a lot of people say, well, Paul named names. Paul didn't do that very often. More often than not, in his epistles, what he did was he shared situations and circumstances and false teachings, and he said, now this is what unnamed people are teaching. Here is the truth. Yeah. He, he did, on a few extreme occasions, mention names, but that really wasn't the focus of his ministry. And I'll take it a step further, because there are some who feel that that is their ministry mm -hmm. on social yeah. media, <laughs> right? They have discernment ministries. I, I think sometimes they're their focus is more, okay, they're not like me and my group, so I, I'm going to destroy them. And that's not helpful, and it's also not biblical. You know, the fact she says it doesn't seem very Christ-like to me. The truth is a lot of ministers speak to things they really don't know what they're talking about. They get a half-truth yeah. and they exploit it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they do it to make themselves look smart or better, which is always wrong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think for me, it was pretty simple. I just thought of the golden rule. There you go. Dude, you know, uh, why do that? It's mm -hmm. going to come back to you. Yeah. You know, do to others what you'd have them do to you. If you want to be criticized all the time, then go ahead and be critical. Mm -hmm. But the other side of this, he also says you will be judged the way you judge others. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty, I, I try not to do that too much <laughs> because uh, he says with the same measure you judge others, it will be judged yeah, unto you. Yeah. So if I set your standard really high, guess what? I just raised my bar. And sometimes you, you should correct error. I get that. But a lot of times it's just about personalities or practice and how they do things. Man, we just leave it alone. Just do your thing. Let others do theirs. God's the ultimate judge. It's not for us to pick on that. I don't think people are not our enemies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and we need to remember that. Yeah, the Bible tells us that. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it, it's not the flesh and blood. Right. It's those spirits yeah. that are behind it all. Yeah, yeah denominations have a, have a good place, and I think if if we begin to label a denomination, this denomination, I mean, there are some we know, perhaps, that are not teaching the truth as we see it, but to, to name a name is to paint with a pretty broad brush, mm -hmm. right? and probably broader than it ought to be, yeah. I would think. 
Yeah. Okay. There was a woman in our church, I'll, I'll do this quickly, uh, who was years ago who was a bank manager. And she said, Pastor John, she said, we don't train people with counterfeit money. We train them with the real thing. The focus is on the real thing. Mm -hmm. But then a couple weeks into the training, we'll slip a counterfeit in there and they'll recognize the counterfeit immediately. So let's focus on the truth. Let's focus on what the word says. Mm -hmm. And it will make that which is not true abundantly obvious without us having to go around pointing our fingers at people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I used to have that philosophy in raising my children in that it was to teach them the truth so that they would be able to recognize that which is false Absolutely. and make good decisions. Yeah. But I've never heard it used with money in, in a bank setting like that. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's very good. I don't need to be teaching false teachings. If I teach the truth, people will recognize false yeah. teachings Absolutely. based on that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's way more important. Way more yeah. important. Well, we're just about out of time. We've only got about 90 seconds. The question I would ask you, maybe you can just shout it out. Who is your favorite Bible character? We actually got a question here from a few. Who's your favorite Bible character? I mean, I'm going to go to the church and answer. It's going to be Jesus. Okay, your favorite Bible character. Well, I, who, who could be more than that? Yeah. I mean, you know, Jesus has to be. I, it wouldn't have been the answer I would have given to that question, but go yes. Well, I, well, your answer would have been? It's too long. Oh, oh it's too long? <laughs> okay. See, that? I told you we're at the end of time now anyway. Well. You, you got a favorite Bible character? The Apostle Paul. He reminds me of me. Yeah. Okay, why? In, in what regard? <laughs> the good and the bad. Okay, uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Mine yeah. was Peter, and I love when he said, you're about to be sifted as wheat. You're going to deny me. But when you do, turn around and strengthen your brothers. Mm -hmm. And I've had failure, and the rest of my life I want to spend it strengthening my brothers. I, yeah, I think, I think mine is David uh, because of the... I've just followed his life so much and what he went through, the mistakes, oh yeah. my goodness. But then becoming a man after God's own heart yep. nonetheless. Yep. And when I look at David, I say that there's hope for me. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there's yeah, hope yeah. for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, thank you very much for sharing. We appreciate that and we're all out of time now. And um, we thank you for being with us. And as you know, we'll be back again next week with another fine panel. And certainly hope you will be joining us then. In the meantime, we thank you for this great panel that's been thank with you. us today. Thank you for all you've had to share this week and last week. It's been, it's been real. It's been real. That's our program today. We'll see you again next week. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.